Good morning, everybody. It's uh, 9 o'clock. The World Economic Forum is a Swiss-based uh, organization. Switzerland is the home of watches. We take them seriously, so uh, let's start on time, and if somebody's late, that's their problem. Uh, welcome. You're, uh, you came to the right place. You actually came to the dark side. This is a, a fascinating panel on a very crucial subject, which is um, on arms sales or arms trade flows, uh, defense spending, weapon transfers, and conflict. Uh, and we have a stellar panel to uh, introduce uh, this topic to us. We will start with uh, Dan Smith, who will give the main presentation on a time-lapse uh, uh, multimedia presentation uh, that he has prepared. Um, and uh, Dan is uh, the director of the uh, Stockholm Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, in Stockholm. He has a long career in uh, peace research. He has also been... Uh, I have to say, at, the, um, um, at PRIO, which is the Oslo Peace Research Institute, and he's also been at the Institute of War and Peace Re uh, Reporting, uh, and has had professorships, uh, among other places, in, in Manchester dealing with this issue. So he's one of the leading experts on this specific subject. I will return to him in a second. We have with us also uh, the director of uh, the Royal United Services Institute, uh, RUSI, um, Karen von Hippel, Dr. Karen von Hippel, who also has uh, both an academic career uh, in this area, but also been operational, worked with the State Department and been part working with uh, General Allen uh, and others in the anti-ISIL campaign and also in counterterrorism more generally. And I have to say, we also worked together many years ago on a big study on integrated missions in the UN for, uh, among others, Jean-Marie Guénaud, uh, who uh, is, um, is currently um, uh, engaged with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva. Until only weeks ago, he was the Director General of the International Crisis Group. And um, uh, he has a background in French uh, diplomacy, and he was for many years the Under Secretary General of uh, um, Peacekeeping at the United Nations and has been writing also uh, academically on the same subject. I am Espen Barteide. I'm currently a member of the Norwegian Parliament. I have been uh, Defense Minister and Foreign Minister in Norway. I mention that because as Defense Minister, I was part of the arms trade. I was purchasing and selling, and as Foreign Minister, I was part of the oversight of uh, limiting illicit arms uh, sales and also engaged in establishing the Arms Trade Treaty. Uh, so this is the panel you have in front of you. Uh, without further ado, I will give the word to Dan uh, to give uh, his opening presentation, please. I think you should stand. Yeah, okay. Blood will flow more easily if I stand as well, and then the talk will be better. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is tell you a story. It's a kind of a good news, uh, bad news story that ends in a question mark. Um, and the question mark, I think, is the most interesting part because that's the part not about the past but the future. And what you're going to be looking at behind me, which is just going to rock on through as, um, uh, as I talk, and I'm not going to refer to point by point but occasionally more in broader terms, is what I like to refer to as an NLVT. That means it's a nifty-looking visual thing. So you should uh, see as we go across on this one at the moment, you're looking at state-based conflicts. This is the pattern of armed conflicts uh, actually going back to, right to 1950. But the part I'm going to be concentrating on will be the part from uh, 1990 or thereabouts. Um, the second element of uh, the, the visuals is the, are you going to put up military spending? The arms trade, that's right, right? All right, military spending, see? Yeah. Arms trade. Oh. Mm -hmm. This is, again, going back to 1950. The conflict data that you saw comes from the University of Uppsala Peace and Conflict yeah. Research Department. The arms trade data comes from CIPRI, my own institute, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. And what you're seeing is the comparative volume at different uh, points of, exp of trade as a whole, export and imports. Arms exports in the green and... Uh, imports in the, the blue. Um, and there's going to be a question probably coming up in your mind about how we make this kind of comparison uh, in the arms trade, which is a very strange, a unique kind of a market, uh, and how we get the totals. Uh, and the answer is a very technical one, which I'll give you if it, if it comes up in the Q&A. And the third thing that you're going to be seeing as it goes through is the totals of military spending, again from 1950, uh, look for the highlight in 1991 where the flash is just coming to the cursor and then as it goes on after that. Now what's the story? So in 1990, 
or thereabouts, world military spending was about $1.5 trillion. World nuclear warheads were about 70,000. Armed conflicts across the world were about 50. And the arms trade was pretty big. Over the next several years, there was a peace dividend. This is the big untold good news story of our era. Despite a spike in armed conflicts in the first half of the 1990s, think of Rwanda, think of the wars of former Yugoslavia, think of the wars of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Despite that spike, actually by 2010, instead of 50 armed conflicts worldwide, there were 30. Military spending, which had been $1.5 trillion, fell to $1.1 trillion within half a decade of the end of the Cold War, by the mid-1990s. And the arms trade also moderated at that time. Nuclear weapons also started coming down. Uh, strategic arms reduction talks, intermediate nuclear force agreements, the breakup of the Soviet Union left two potential new nuclear weapon states, Kazakhstan and Ukraine. They both gave up all of their nuclear weapons. So there was a distinct peace dividend through uh, the period until about 2010. The decline in the number of armed conflicts had probably bottomed out by about 2006, 2007. But still, the situation was, in, by historical standards, relatively optimistic at the time. What drove this peace dividend? Firstly, obviously, the end of the Cold War, and the end of the um, military confrontation between the US and the USSR allowed a reduction in spending, military spending, on many sides. That also, it also allowed the reduction in nuclear weapons, especially between the US and uh, former Soviet Union. And at the same time, the UN <coughs> was freed up to be able to put more energy, more time, more resources into both peacemaking and peace building. A study done for Kofi Annan in the early 2000s found that by two th from 1990 until 2002, the number of peace agreements that had been concluded in that 12-year period was more than the number in the entire two centuries up until 1990. In other words, diplomatic productivity went through the roof. And more than that, the international community, and I have, do have a feeling that in the late 1990s that was a term that was worth using. I think it's become devoid of meaning in recent years, but at one time it was worth using. The international community was learning how to sustain peace agreement, agreements. A study in the mid-1990s concluded that about 50% of peace agreements broke down within five years of having been signed. In other words, it was like a toss of a coin. You know, when you signed a peace agreement, you just toss a coin to decide whether you're going back to war or not within a few years. A decade on, and that figure had fallen to about 35% of peace agreements were uh, failing within five years. A few years further on, and some research was showing it was down to 20% were failing within five years. In other words, peace agreements, once they got through that, that first year or so, were starting to, to be durable. They were starting to be sustained. So there was a really a good news story going on until about 2010. In the last seven or eight years, most of the indicators that I've been referring to have gone negative. World military spending now is about $1.7 trillion. So it fell from 1.5 to 1.1. It had an increase in the late 90s, the early 2000s, uh, especially the early 2000s, um, to do with the re-equipping for and around the Iraq and Afghanistan in interventions. It increased further to, through the first decade, fueled by uh, high petrol, uh, high oil prices worldwide, uh, big spending from the Middle East and from, from Russia. Um, and in the last few years now, it has plateaued at this level near $1.7 trillion. CIPRI's figures for 20, 
16, which are the most recent ones we have available at the moment, show a less than 1%, a marginal increase over the previous year. So we're steady at a high level at the moment. We won't do a new data launch on military spending until uh, the spring, so then we'll see what the figures look like for 2017. But I suspect it'll again just inch up a bit. Within that overall picture, there are a lot of variations. For example, the military spending in Latin America has continued to, to, to get smaller. Military spending in Europe is going to start picking up. Uh, military spending in the Middle East has been, um, has been high, as one, one would expect. The arms trade has taken a kind of a similar sort of path. It moderated during the 1990s. We do our data in five-year bunches in order to try to smooth out uh, potential odd discrepancies. So, and again, we'll be, doing a, we'll be launching a new package of data in, a, in about a month and a half's time. But on the figures up to the end of 2016, that five-year period until then, the arms trade had increased by 10% over the previous five-year period, up to 2011. And that is the highest level it has been since the end of the Cold War. So we live on an armed and warring planet. And that hasn't changed from the end of the Cold War. But it was for a while less armed, and it was also less warring. It's now more armed, and on the warring side, armed conflicts today are back up to over 50. So it's from 50 in 1990 <coughs> to 30 in 2010, and back up to over 50 now. As for nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads, that global total of 70,000, that's one of the few semi-good news bits that still persists. The total of nuclear weapons worldwide is still declining. From 70,000 or thereabouts in the late 1980s, uh, it's at about 15,000 now. So that's a dramatic increase, even if 15,000 is still unimaginable destructive power. The bad news on the nuclear weapon side is, of course, on the one hand, that the number of nuclear weapon states has increased, um, most recently because North Korea is now a confirmed nuclear weapon state after its uh, nuclear and missile testing of the last couple of years. And secondly, because our nuclear arms control has got completely stalled, it's bogged down. The INF Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Forces, the cruise missiles and SS-20s, which were the, uh, the focus of attention in the, um, during the 1980s, uh, that treaty, both the US and Russia are accusing the other of breaking it, and essentially it looks like it's a, it's a broken straw now. Um, the START agreement, the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, uh, is still being implemented, so that's good. But on the other hand, there are no new New START um, talks going on at the moment, and um, little sign that there will be. So the, on the nuclear side, there is also... Um, sadly, bad news to go along with the, with the good. Why has this happened since 2010? What has been going on? There are a number of drivers of armed conflict and insecurity that one can look at, uh, and I won't go into any detail here. I'll just headline them. I, to me, um, when one looks at the armed conflicts in Africa, indeed in the Middle East, those which are rising up again and persisting in South and Southeast Asia, one thinks very much about inequal global inequalities. All the indicators continue to sharpen about that to get uh, nastier and nastier. This is the only topic in which 42 equals 3.7 billion. At least that's the figures according to Oxfam of 42 families owning as much wealth as half the world's population combined. And there are a lot of other um, killer statistics to throw around about, uh, about global inequality. I think secondly that uh, competition for natural resources continues to, to heat up despite a moderation in the price of some natural resources in the last few years. The pressures of climate change are beginning to be felt. The, the knock-on consequences of that on social stability through the vector, for example, of water insecurity and food, food prices. Just this morning, I read that um, Cape Town will be out of water by, uh, by about April. What pressures will lack of water put on mm. social stability in Cape Town. As always, the poor pay the higher price uh, because the rich can afford the, the increased price of, of water, which we'll undoubtedly, we'll undoubtedly see. So those pressures are all there, and they're pushing forward, pressing all the time. 
But over and above that, we also have a change in the world system, a change in the balance of power worldwide. During the 1990s, as I said earlier, the term international community started to have some meaning. The international community was doing things. It was bound together in relationships of working on peace and conflict issues amongst others uh, worldwide. That has not completely gone. Look at the Paris Climate Agreement. Look at the agreement on the sustainable development goals. There is uh, unity within, amongst international actors on a whole number of issues. But actually, the capacity to work together on these peace and security issues is being challenged all the time by political rivalries, by the behavior of the, mm. the world leaders. And we certainly have, not to go into this in any kind of detail, not to mention words like fire and fury, but we certainly have some world leaders at the moment who seem to have relatively little respect for the institutional framework, which was one of the bulwarks of growing peace and the good news story during uh, the 1990s and the earlier part of this century. Um, partly because it gives you a sort of a, a less abstract view of what I'm talking about and partly because I'm going to use it as a metaphor. Let's look at the night sky over Syria or the view from the sky at night over Syria in 2012, and then jump to the same view in 2016. Hmm. Jump back and jump again. That's what has been happening in Syria as a result of the war. That's one way of visualizing what war means in the country in, in Syria. But as I say, I'm kind of using that metaphorically as well. And the question is, in the world, in the, in the institutional frameworks, in the institutional community, can we and how do we switch those lights back on? That's the question mark with which I'll finish today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, for a fascinating uh, presentation uh, of very important trends. Uh, and I think that leaves a lot of room for uh, a further discussion. And I think I will start with uh, Jean-Marie. Uh, if you have some immediate reactions on what you, what can this tell us about the state of the world and how the state of the world has been changing lately? Well, I think the, the key point is the discord at the center, is the fact that the global powers are in fundamental disagreement on many issues, and that has several consequences. You, you mentioned uh, how peace accord, peacekeeping, uh, did uh, contain and, and end conflicts uh, in the immediate aftermath of the, uh, of, of the, Cold War, of the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Now, we see today that the Security Council is paralyzed uh, and that peacekeeping, which by the way, an uh, interesting figure, it's about half a percent of uh, world mm -hmm. military spending. <laughs> so it puts things in perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, it is expensive, but not that expensive no. when you compare it to uh, to, to global military spending. So peacekeeping is in deep trouble today because it doesn't have the political underpinning uh, that makes it successful. Uh, and more fundamentally, uh, the global powers, and after all, we are in Switzerland, so I, would, I, will, I will use an image borrowed from uh, the insurance business. Uh, Swiss Re, other big, um, uh, <coughs> other big reinsurance companies are based in this, in this country. Reinsurance means that the cost of being safe, uh, uh, the cost of insuring yourself against uh, problems is lowered because the pool is broader. And that, in a way, what global powers uh, did. Now, in the various regions of the world, there is no sense of reinsurance. You don't know where the buck stops. And that means, and uh, in, when one looks at the, at the maps, uh, at the evolving map that you showed, you see the rise in uh, military spending in arms trade in uh, some regions of the world, not in uh, Latin America, but certainly in the Middle East, certainly in Asia, and probably now coming in, in Europe. And there's one common factor to all those, to, to this rise, is the sense that reinsurance is, uh, is, not, is not there. And that's, that's a big issue. The other, the other issue is that with the end of the ideological confrontation between one camp and the other, that's in a way a very good thing. It frees up countries from uh, being a sort of pigeonhole in, uh, in, in a little compartment. But in another, in another the, the flip side of that is that it creates a lot of unpredictability 
and so when you, are, when you are in a situation of an unpredictability, you want to protect uh, yourself. And that makes for a more, what I would say, what I would call a more bottom-up uh, world. And, well, in the maps, there's one thing where, that does not appear is the, all the uh, intra-state uh, yeah. uh, mm. uh, violence. And what we see today, uh, and I will conclude on that, what we see today is a combination of bottom-up and connectivity. Mm. And that's quite dangerous, and let me be a little more explicit <coughs> on that. What I mean by that is that most conflicts today are driven by very local uh, dynamics. Uh, you see it in Syria, you see it in the Horn of Africa. Each, uh, you, each conflict is driven, and even North Korea is driven by uh, uh, the fragility of North Korea itself. But these local situations, they are connected uh, to the bigger picture. And that's what I would call a kind of uh, 1914 scenario. Uh, you had in 1914, very unhappy uh, Serbs, uh, who, and one of them uh, shot uh, the Archduke in, uh, in Sarajevo. Uh, that was a conflict in the Balkans that, well, the Chancelleries might be informed about it, but that was, some, that was a rather local agenda. But it was connected to a bigger strategic picture that drew in uh, all the uh, major powers and uh, that led to a world war. Uh, we are not there uh, today because of the existence of, the, of nuclear weapons. Uh, but the existence of nuclear weapons is both a break on uh, reckless escalation, but at the same time, of course, if ever uh, there was escalation, that would be catastrophic. We see uh, every day in Syria how American planes, uh, Russian planes are in the same airspace and uh, managing uh, more or less uh, to avoid any incident. But we see a local conflict with global consequences uh, that could be the match that lights a much uh, bigger fire. And so this rise in uh, weapons trade, uh, this diffusion of the weapons trade, I think it should be uh, for all of us a very uh, serious uh, warning sign. Thank you, Jean-Marie. I think the message is that uh 2018 is the new 1913 or something like that, <laughs> yeah. um, which of course is very promising. This is a natural segue into mm. your uh, your work, uh, Karen, because uh, you know, in the 20, 15, 20 years ago, we talked about all these new conflicts, mm. but we were still, as, as Dan has told us, we still had the comfort that there was uh, some kind of order at the core. But now I think what well, the message so far is there's no order at the core and there's no order in the periphery either. So what do we take away from? Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Espen, and thank you to the World Economic Forum for hosting this very important panel. Uh, what I wanted to do, maybe just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about what the data don't tell us, the, the, the data that Dan presented. Um, and of course, it doesn't tell us about the illicit trafficking, the secondhand weapons, and sometimes, of course, the transfers from intelligence agencies uh, into a, a number of conflicts uh, that we've seen over the years. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever be able to get that latter category, but I, I think if we can get a fuller picture of the illicit trade, I think we would, that would also help us understand uh, the conflicts of it, but it will have a richer picture. Now, I know at CIPRI, uh, Dan and his team do a lot of work in this space, uh, and it couldn't all be captured in this map, but uh, at, at my think tank at RUSI, we, uh, use uh, financial intelligence. We uh, look for financial footprints for a variety of uh, illicit uh, activities. So we use, we follow the money for illicit wildlife trafficking. We look at human smuggling and trafficking. We look at new uh, proliferation finance. Uh, we look at uh, trade and goods such as cigarette smuggling, alcohol, uh, fake pharmaceuticals, etc. And we try to follow the money. Uh, using a number of means, I, you know, generally uh, the financial tools are used for financial crime, looking at fraud and uh, money laundering, et cetera, but it's used less often for the broader response to organized crime. And so I think that's one way of, of trying to get a fuller picture of what is going on, uh, especially because arms sales obviously cost a lot of money, and so there'll be big movements of money to... Uh, uh, back and forth, uh, it's difficult to do, and I'm not sure we'd ever get, you know, 100% accuracy. Of course, I think Dan might be able to tell us 
what kind of, uh, how, cl how close to a full picture we could get if we had better data on the illicit flows of arms. Uh, but certainly that would help us. I think in, if you look at a, a case like Syria, where, which, a few of, uh, which has been talked about already in the panel, um, Syria has been just an importer of arms you know, uh, throughout the, the region. A lot of them are secondhand. The place is flooded with uh, SAM missiles. Some don't work anymore and some do. Uh, so there's old weapons from previous conflicts. There are a lot of, uh, of various uh, countries and uh, individuals were sending in weapons to a whole bunch of different jihadists and other groups. And so it really is, it became a bit of an arms bazaar in many ways. Uh, and I think if we had a bit bigger picture or a better picture of what was going on, we might understand the conflict better. I think Libya is very similar in that sense. And even Yemen is, you know, Yemen, Somalia, some of these places where we uh, have difficulty going into these places, it's often hard to know what impact uh, all these weapons are having. And of course, I think if you have a fuller picture, that, if, that helps the, the negotiators understand who has the, the, the might. It, it also helps understand who the spoilers are and how to, how to address the spoilers. So I think that might be one way. We, we don't yet, at Rusium, I think, we don't yet look at arms, but I'm, I think it, it's a really interesting approach. I'm going to talk to my colleagues about it when I get back to London. Um, just one final point to, to mention what Jean-Marie just said at the very end about, uh, about Syria or, uh, you know, I, I think many times people ignore unpleasant parts of the wor world at their peril. We saw that in Afghanistan, we saw that in Somalia, and of course we saw that in Syria. President Obama didn't want to do more in Syria, as we all know. And he had very good reasons. He didn't want another Iraq. He, he was nervous about unintended consequences of action. But of course, inaction really had consequences. Now, if you look at what happened in Syria, uh, of course, the, the, the length of this civil war really allowed ISIL to metastasize and to grow and to plan and carry out attacks throughout Europe, which of course, as we all know, caused a lot of panic. The migration crisis was, of course, caused by the inability to, to resolve the Syrian crisis. You had millions of refugees being held in camps in the neighboring countries. And of course, those countries could only hold that many people for so long. And we saw the dams burst in 2015, 2016, when humans just started flooding across Europe. So we had very skillful politicians in Europe and in the United States exploiting uh, not only the terrorist threat, which actually wasn't as big as they they were claiming it to be, and as well as these migration flows. And you know that really did contribute. It's hard to measure this, of course, but I believe it really contributed to Brexit, to the election of Trump, and to the rise in some of these other populist parties in Europe. So I think that might be something interesting for discussion. Excellent. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Espen. Jean -Marie, uh, yeah, I wanted to, to react to uh, the point that uh, you just made, because I think it's really key. This, we used to think that there was interstate conflict mm on one side, intrastate on the other, and there were two different uh, beasts, so to speak. Uh, and what we see today is that they're really combining. The intrastate mm -hmm. is with them and all the illegal uh, flows of weapons that, uh, that you describe. Uh, the interstate brings the kind of industrial level of war with uh, <coughs> aviation, with artillery, um, and things that usually non-state uh, actors uh, don't have. And well, you, you have this picture of the lights uh, turn off in, uh, in, in Syria. That's the result of the industrialization of war. You mm -hmm. don't destroy uh, the electricity with Kalashnikov. You need, uh, you need an industrial level of, uh, uh, of war. And the real danger and horror of today's world is the combination mm -hmm. of this intrastate dynamics which spreads the conflict which makes it, which fragments it, which makes it very difficult to solve. And then the state actors, which bring the industrial level of destruction that then makes the situation mm -hmm. uh, irreparable for, for years, if not decades. I think that I'd like some other comments on that because I think this is a, a major point that we've also conceptualized, not only intellectually, but also legally. There's a, there was a set of rules, there is a set of rules for war when war is actually between states. And then there's a different set of rules for uh, any other uh, situation with human rights and rule of law and so on. And when this is blurred, um, it, it was a very neat distinction. The only problem, it doesn't work as well as it did because of all these uh, 
France then. Yeah. I mean, since 1945, since the end of the Second World War, the vast majority of armed conflicts that are registered on this map or any other count are internal. In other words, they involve usually a government and one or more in insurrectionary groups. Um, the, the new thing or the, the newly perceived aspect of this is wars, armed conflicts in which the government is actually not involved. Mm -hmm. That are wars between different groups of, of mm -hmm. non-state actors mm -hmm. or between non-state actors and a fragment of the state in some chaotic circumstances. But in, intrastate or internal armed conflict has been the dominant mm -hmm. form of armed conflict for basically the modern era, I mean, or the postmodern era, the post-Second World War era. And this, the, the fragmentation question is enormously important because that's what, that is one of the biggest things which leads to the breakdown of peace agreements, peace processes, is that one side or the other, sometimes both, divides. You know, you have a kind of wartime unity and then you have peacetime fragmentation. And that's what will hamper efforts in Colombia now. That's what will hamper uh, efforts for, for years in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, in Somalia, in Congo, in Nigeria, in the most um, sort of optimistic scenarios for those countries. There are always going to be these, these other fragmented groups. And a, a man called Robert Tabor writing about guerrilla warfare some, I don't know, it must be almost 50 years ago now, classic book, The War of the Flea. It's very, very <coughs> short and easy read about why are guerrilla forces, why are insurrection forces so strong when they confront even this industrialized warfare. And one of the things that he remarks on it is this, the sticking power of insurrectionary forces needs to be understood. And he says, once you have raised the banner of insurrection and got blood on it, it's terribly difficult to put it back down again. <laughs> So the guerrillas, he said, start fighting for whatever reason. They continue because they must. So there is a dynamic in violent conflict itself, which to address you have a myriad of different activities sustained by an international institution or international institutional framework. As that, as you said, Jean-Marie, is the core breaks down, the effectiveness of those activities at the local level break down. And that's another way in which the connectivity from top to bottom, in whichever direction it's going, whether for peace or war, is crucial to understanding the pickle we're in. So um, what is the policy recommendation that comes out of all of this? Stop <laughs> doing stupid stuff. <laughs> I think prevention is the key policy recommendation because once, the, as you say, I mean, uh, once the conflict starts, once there is blood on the floor, it's much, much harder to, to, to end the conflict. And also because of the fragmentation, that's one of the issues in, in Syria, it's, it's difficult enough to have three or four stakeholders to sit around the table. When you have dozens, hundreds of them, it's an impossible task. And also the more the conflict lasts, the more you have outside actors involved. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes such a multi-layered scene that to align the circle of the local uh, fighters of the regional uh, stakeholders and of the global stakeholders uh, becomes almost impossible. That's what we see in the, in the stalled uh, uh, peace process in, in Syria. Once you feel you begin to have something at the local level, it doesn't work mm. at the regional. If it, if it works at the global, it doesn't work at the regional. For instance, we've seen Russia and the United States at some point appearing, appearing, I and mean, I'm cautious <laughs> on that, to, to get closer. But does that mean that between Iran, uh, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, there was a meeting of the minds? No. And so that is the difficulty. And so that's really the case for prevention. It's not just a humanitarian case. It's just, it's, it is a strategic case today. And, and if I could jump in there, uh, I mean, I think Syria is a great example of pretty much everything that can go wrong in one conflict, uh, you know, falling together in one place. But what, what worries me, uh, and both Dan and uh, Jean-Marie mentioned earlier is, you know, your reinsurance point. Uh, if, if the U.S. is not going to be the, the global leader right now to, to push for uh, advocating peace in ways that I think we're, we're used to, at least uh, in, in more traditional ways where you're looking for more of a democratic situation to emerge, um, it's very concerning 
what happens to the world and how things could fragment to the to the you know the highest bidder. So Russia is the most interested here. China is the most interested here, and it's very worrying. I mean, if you look, at Syria is another great example because we've gone from a situation where the U.S., U.K., and a few other countries were leading the peace process on Syria unsuccessfully, but they were pushing very hard. And now we're in a situation where it's Russia, Iran, and Turkey, although Turkey I put in a separate category, but Russia and Iran leading the peace process on Syria. And who thinks that Russia and Iran you know, have the same goals for Syria? And it's not clear to me that President Trump cares, actually. And so you know, this is one of those things that just seems to have gone unnoticed, that these two countries are now in charge of the peace process. So you know that I, I'm actually much more worried about the future, given the the first year of the Trump presidency, um, than I would have been had mm. obviously a, another person won that position. But there, there is a I think there's a strategic point to to be made because what we see is geography is reasserting itself. Yeah. When there was a uh, an ideological global divide, you could say that there was a fundamental interest of the United States or the Soviet Union in some remote place that were thousands of miles away from Moscow or, for, or from Washington. In the absence of an ideological divide, geography matters. So if you are Iran, if you're Russia, uh, you're much closer to the action than the United States is. And so in a way you have escalation dominance because your interests uh, are much more at, at, much more at stake uh, than the interests of the United States. Uh, and you see that in the number of situations, the neighbors matter more and more. Yeah, I think another way of saying that, if you have one party um, accepting to commit, uh, to die for a cause, and others yeah. don't, yeah. Uh, the, the one who's committed to die. There is, is an imbalance of yeah. interest. <laughs> yeah. And then having more weapons doesn't necessarily neutralize that. Yeah, Dan. yeah I was just going to pick up on Jean Marie's prevention point. But I think that the complexity of this whole topic, or the, the challenging nature of the, the topic, is that there is, a, there is a long line, there's a long process through which we have to think ourselves in order to identify what would be the most peace-positive policies mm. to, be, to be following. And so, of course, we spend a lot of time at the most explosive part of that line, which is where the war is happening where the people are suffering, where, you know, we don't know the figures, but the common estimate that is used is somewhere over 400,000 and under 470,000 people killed in, in Syria uh, during the civil war. Uh, the millions of, of refugees, the highest ever level, if you include stateless people, going over 70 million now. Uh, I mean, that's the population of a good-sized country, and most, all of the increase in, re in recent years has essentially been to do with, with conflict. So we put a lot of emphasis down on that part of the line. But when you, get, when you start talking prevention, which is, which is right, and it's one of the, again, another hopeful sign of the present is that we have a UN Secretary General who has made prevention <coughs> one of you know, his, his prime missions. There's prevention in a kind of diplomatic, early warning, early action kind of way. But there's prevention far, far upstream as yeah. well. And this is where I want to link to one of the themes which has come out at this meeting of the World Economic Forum and seems to have come out every, every year now for the last few years, which is rising global inequalities. Yeah. I mean, there's something like 800 million people live on under $1.25 a day. There's about another billion who live under, on under $2 a day. There's about another billion on top of that who live under about $3 a day. So that's nearly half the world's population living on less than $3 a day, which the $3 a day mark is not described as extreme poverty in our current vocabulary. But you know, it's hardly a lavish lifestyle. But one of the things that $3 a day allows you to do that maybe less than $1 doesn't is you can see. Right? What the other half, what the richer half have is very visible to most of the people in the poorer half of the world. And it's not just a problem of poverty driving armed conflict, it is a problem of visible inequality. And this links to the point that you were making about connectivity. And we, we have to think about the world in, in that kind of way. These dark corners that we don't think, do not think that we are a dark corner to people there. 
they see, they, they understand, they know what is happening in the world, they know they're getting a raw deal, they know they have no prospects and other people do have prospects. And that feeds resentment and it helps create an army, effectively, um, ready to be recruited by, it was a term which I think you introduced me to, uh, Espen, recruited by conflict entrepreneurs mm. um, uh, around the world. So I think that idea of layering prevention up the line is very important. And then once you have a peace process, how do we know? You, we've been mentioning the First World War. What do we describe the 1920s and 1930s as? Do we say this is post-war Europe or pre-war Europe? Actually, mm. we say it's interwar. You don't know after an armed conflict whether you are now genuinely in a post-war period. Is peace going to sustain itself? We'll only get to a self-sustaining peace process if you continue to think in those prevention terms after uh, achieving a certain kind of stability with a, with a good written agreement. Mm. Actually, in, in the early 30s, people talked about it as the post-war period. Yeah. Because yeah. they did yeah. little did they know that it would be yes. the pre-war yeah. period. And I happen to have an, a, a, a number of National Geographic magazine from 1930, which has some nice pictures of Sarajevo. And, the, and, and it says here, a, a couple takes a lovely stroll, and it's imagined that only a few years ago there was a violent conflict mm -hmm. in Sarajevo. And of course, looking at that in the 90s, we could see some continuity. Um, I think the Secretary General is perfectly spot on in saying, uh, putting prevention at the core. Uh, um, however, most Secretary Generals start by saying mm. we should do more prevention and then they end up uh, managing crises, which is what, what takes, takes most of your attention. Um, we can open up for the floor now. Maybe some people have some questions. I think uh, here, please introduce yourself. Mm. Thank you very much, Stefan Flukiker, Swiss government. A fantastic panel, thank you. Um, just one point, and I don't think it's a minor point on, obviously, as you s keep stressing it, inequality. Um, shouldn't we make the differentiation between um, inequality within countries and between countries? Because if you look at between countries, actually the picture looks brighter. And, uh, but the, the real failure is within societies or within countries. The Cape Town example that you mentioned is a failure of, well, it, it's a natural phenomenon, but it's also a failure of domestic policy. And prevention, you know, as, uh, international prevention can only go so far in, preven in, in preventing it. The, the ultimate reason that, that I would challenge that is, that, you know, the, the ultimate failure of our development policies of, of the failed institutions in those countries like Yemen, uh, Sudan, uh, and, and some other candidates. Thank you, good point. Anybody yeah, I, like I mean, I th that's right. The, the global indicators on inequality have been getting sharper within most countries, and they have been getting narrower uh, between countries. One can look at that from the point of view of the sort of national identification and say, well, this is good. Right? You can break it down a different way, and you can say that what is happening is that there is actually an increasingly interconnected and unified global elite and an increasingly fragmented and weaker um, global bottom two-thirds. Uh, and so the good news figure, unfortunately, is part of emphasizing just how difficult things are getting uh, wi within, within countries. Uh, otherwise, I, c I completely agree with the point which you're making about um, the, these issues will be resolved if they are to be resolved at local, provincial, city, and national level, but international support and an appropriate international framework will be key in several cases, especially the, the most difficult ones. Yeah, in, 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 uh, 19, uh, in 1970, there were roughly 2.1 billion people living in extreme poverty uh, today, uh, so that was more than half of the world's population. Mm -hmm. Uh, today, uh, something like 700, 800 million. Uh, uh, so that's uh, about a tenth mm -hmm. of the world population. I think when one looks at the geography of it, a lot is uh, about China uh, and Asia more, general, more generally. And I think we, we have to focus on, on, uh, on Africa, on Sub-Saharan Africa, and, uh, and some conflict countries in the Middle East where uh, now the situation is going down. Thank you. So the second question was here. Trisha. Hi, um, fantastic panel, thank you. Trisha de Bourgrave, I'm a, I'm a writer. 
Um, I know that uh, it's very popular to just bring up the C word, which is corruption, and uh, which has become the big C word, the cancer of the world. Um, when you were talking, Dan, about the fact that we don't seem to have uh, an international community the way we did, and the world order is fractured now, and we don't quite understand it uh, in terms of imposing itself on, on these conflicts. Um, what corruption has become is systemic. It's not just occasional, and we are, in the international community, the enablers of a lot of this corruption starting at root level there, and we know that it leads to all this extremism. So in our own way, uh, could our influence be that we, we make sure that we have checks and balances that uh, don't enable that kind of corruption to run rampant? The whole point is these resources are being taken out of these countries, and you talk about the inequality, but I think that a lot of this is based on the fact that they see it in their own countries, that their own resources are leaving, and we are complicit in allowing those resources to be made into uh, dollar figures in bank accounts. So maybe we should be uh, much more stringent with ourselves in terms of how we can influence uh, conflict rather than in the old-fashioned way. Mm. Not old-fashioned, but you know, an mm. old world order. Mm. Thank you. Excellent question, thank you. Uh, hold, hold it a little bit because I'd like to take okay. a few more questions and you can group them. Yeah. So Mr. Karim here. Kazim, sorry. Hi, this is Hakan, uh, CEO of Akbank from Turkey. Uh, uh, fantastic panel, uh, very enlightening, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about NATO and also UN uh, Security Council. Uh, looking forward, uh, its evolution, effectiveness uh, in such uh, areas. Thank you. Mm. And then the third one is the fr fr front row, that's Mr. Kasim. Thank you, Mr. Kalam from Dubai. Uh, my question is uh, to Dan. Uh, have you seen any correlation between uh, the arms built up and a potential conflict uh, in that region? Uh, is, is, is it an indication of an early warning a system that a conflict might happen because of the arms built up? I'm, I'm focusing on the region rather than superpowers uh, deterrence. Mm -hmm. Thank you, excellent. Three very important questions. Who would like to start? Dan, maybe. Yes, I'll start, I'll start with that one. Um, I think the answer is a very, very guarded yes, that the um, increasing arms trade can be uh, one of, arms imports can be one of the indicators of rising conflict risk. Uh, I think that we probably looked at um, Saudi Arabian arms imports about 20 years ago and from a European or North American perspective, we're thinking this was pretty much of a, a vanity project. You know, when it came to the, to the wars in the, in the region, the Saudi input was not particularly uh, central or crucial to the result either way, um, but they had some nice looking aircraft and so on. I don't think anybody is justified, uh, even does talk about it in that light now, mm -hmm. uh, in the, after the last five years. Um, so the build-up of a military apparatus was intended for use if the circumstances um, demanded use. Um, and in that sense, perhaps there was a reading of the regional situation in, in Riyadh, which um, we were not taking seriously enough um, in, in Western think tanks and research centers. There are other cases where, for example, in Rwanda, there were people who saw the inflow of weapons and connected that to the training that militias were receiving in the months of uh, late 1993 and early 1994. And they said, something terrible is going to happen here. And uh, the messages were ignored and something terrible did happen there. And they had, so they had used the armed supplies as a, as a, as a part of that. Um, if I... With NATO and the UN Security Council, the, the question that you raised, I think there's an additional thing to add to what uh, Jean-Marie was saying about the difficulty at the core, because we think of that in terms of you know, the US and its allies not agreeing with Russia and its allies, or China and, and, and its um, like-minded uh, governments around the world. But actually, there's something else, which is that since 2010, while this is 
because it's intangible, it's hard to measure. There seems to me to have been a decline in the self-confidence of leadership and the capacity and the influence of leadership in Europe and to some degree also in North, in North America as well. And I think that the uh, financial and ep economic crisis hit in a kind of political psychological sense far more deeply than was, was realized at, at the time. And I sense there's a kind of, you know, there used to be a kind of almost bravura, which of course could go badly wrong, but people thought there were problems that could be fixed. Yugoslavia is breaking up. The hour of Europe has arrived. Did, does anybody remember that being said? Um, people talking about going to Yugoslavia and knocking some heads together to get some good sense going. I remember a couple of British politicians talking in that kind of language, for example. People don't talk like that now. They, they look at Syria and they wring their hands. How are we supposed to do anything here? Um, not that I think that bravura self-confidence is the answer, but I do feel that a, a lack of self-confidence and a lack of some of that drive and creativity, perhaps, is a part of the difficulties that we, we experience in the international institution. And the corruption question which you raise, I think is, very, is a very big one. It, it is, as you say, systemic. It's also um, to do with incidents. I mean, for example, the illicit arms trade, which uh, we pay attention to, but which we don't include in the figures which were going across the, um, the screen um, because we don't find reliable enough data there. Um, that is, that machinery, of, of course, that's absolutely greased by, by corruption. Um, we, as a rich part of the world, are not just uh, implicitly complicit in a corrupt system. We, we benefit from it uh, in terms of the natural resources coming out of, uh, out of countries. Um, but one can also say, from a, kind of a little bit more hard-nosed point of view, that corrupt systems, well, both that corrupt systems can function efficiently and also that international systems can function efficiently even if there is corruption. I mean, if we're talking about the deficiencies in the international system, the international framework now, and we're thinking about corruption, we're not going to kid ourselves that that corruption is a new thing since 2010, right? Three trillion dollars um, of tax evasion money in tax havens did not appear overnight. It's been building up over time, $22 trillion of tax avoidance money in tax havens did not appear overnight. It's been building up over time. Um, Adnan Khashoggi was greasing deals between North American airline companies and Saudi Arabia. And his Japanese counterpart, whose name also began with a K, but which I forget for the moment, and I don't want to say the wrong name, was also doing that back in the 70s and 80s. Mm. I mean, you know, the international system is able to tolerate a certain amount of corruption. So although I think that corruption is an absolutely fundamental issue, right, um, I don't think that the reason for the decline of the in institutional framework looking after peace and security issues is directly traceable to, to that or not to, certainly not to that alone. Mm. Interesting. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, comments on those yeah. questions yep. here? Uh, Jean-Marie first and then Karen. On, uh, on corruption, and I, I'd broaden the point, uh, I, I think that most, uh, most people would agree that full war is not good for business, but full peace is not good for some business. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, and so there is a real interest among many mm. players in keeping states off balance in the gray area where there is a state but a dysfunctional state. And that's where really corruption uh, prospers. And when we try to structure peace processes, uh, we too often work on the assumption that all the actors want peace. They want a decline in the level of violence. They don't necessarily want peace, and mm -hmm. we have to factor that in. On the second point, the institutions, NATO, uh, UN Security Council, I believe institutions work if, they are, if they are, there is an underpinning of shared values and norms. And behind the crisis of institutions, there's a crisis of norms. And that crisis of norms, I mean, it has, when we could spend a whole hour discussing them, but it's about what is legitimate use of force, for instance. Uh, 
And we see in the evolution, even cyber warfare, what is war, what is not war. I mean, the uh, uh, weak state from which uh, terrorist attacks are launched. Is it uh, a case of self-defense uh, or not? I mean, this is a trend that, has start that started uh, years ago. And I think the institutions of today, they are uncomfortable uh, with that situation because they were designed for a situation in which, I mean, to come back to the point of Espen, the distinction between war and peace was very clear. Uh, now we don't have that distinction, and the institutions are in crisis. And I think there, I would add, I mean, the, the role of the European Union is going to be very important, because I said geography matters. Uh, the European Union is a group of countries that are geographically uh, uh, con con contiguous. <laughs> And so you need in the world champions for norms. The EU could be one. Last point on arms buildup. It's all the, I mean, if you, one can believe it sustains peace if you believe in balance of power. Uh, balance of power, historically, has not been a very good foundation for lasting, uh, for lasting peace. And I, I think today uh, what we see is that the development of the arms trade for the global powers, which are the main providers of, uh, of weaponry, they are in competition with each other. And so they are in a weaker position to uh, put a damper on local rivalries because they benefit uh, from them. So it's a vicious circle that sets in. Mm. Karen, last but not least. Yeah, here. just a, a few quick points. I mean, on Trisha's point about uh, corruption, and by the way, Trisha is an author of a fabulous blog, so I recommend uh, signing up for it. Uh, you're absolutely right that it needs to be done on both sides. So it needs to be, you know, the the the, the donor countries or the the selling countries in the case of weapons, as well as uh, as well as the recipient countries. And the good news is that uh, there is much more of a focus. I mean, David Cameron had a big focus in the UK last year on corruption. The the summit was held in the UK, and I think social media has been really beneficial in this case because it's very it's easier to track what is happening. So a former colleague of mine in the State Department was watching all the YouTube videos of all these jihadist groups and who their donors were. And the jihadist groups would say, thanks to brother so-and-so in Kuwait for, for giving us this. And someone else would say, thanks to brother so-and-so in, you know, in, in, in Saudi Arabia. These were usually individuals that were supporting these groups. But actually, you could do a lot of tracking in various ways and get quite clever about what's going on, too. So I think it's a really it's a critical point. Um, just on your point about uh, NATO and the, and the Security Council, and I agree with Jean-Marie, I think what I worry about is if the US is not going to provide that moral leadership, and another country or institution or groupings of countries need to do that. Mm. You know, the, the EU is the EU with the UK, the EU, the UN, some other group has to do it because otherwise, uh, you know, we, we, we're gonna have a much more complicated conversation about the same thing next year. Mm. Thank you, Karen. I am um, uh, uh, two minutes to wrap it up. Uh, uh, just a couple of points from my side as well after listening to this. First, I, I have a comment on NATO. So before you, <laughs> do you have a second, I'll answer your, your NATO point. Um, <laughs> I follow NATO very closely for many years. I think, I think the answer here is that NATO was born in the Cold War. It was set up as an Article 5 deterrent organization. When the international community moment happened in the 90s, also NATO started to uh, reshape itself as an actor of that international community and particularly in the debate about the Kosovo war you could get the impression from some quarters that NATO had become the armed wing of Amnesty International um, and then now uh, NATO is back focusing on core defense and deterrence and article 5 uh, which is logical in a sense in this world and it's back to being a, a defense organization in, in, in a core uh, core issue which is its purpose in the first place that was NATO. My, my, my other reflection on what also continuing on Karen's is that corruption has been there for a very long time, but corruption plus rising inequalities plus transparency has made people who might have been mm. more or less tolerant with their leaders being corrupt mm. becoming far less tolerant mm. because mm. A, they know, mm. and B, they just experienced a financial crisis. So I think the reason that you got really, this became much more a political crisis was not because it started, but because it became more visible and it hurt more when you were just thrown out of your flat. And on top of that, you realize that your leadership has been corrupt. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. probably. Uh, 
But I mean, but then I, and, and then I want to recognize uh, Gabriel O'Donnell from uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University, who's been helping us with uh, very nice uh, visuals. And uh, Dan, Jean Marie, and Karen for uh, excellent presentations. Thank you all for coming. Give me a Thank you, Espen. Yes.